You and I, I mean, I think in passing have talked even in the last year about kind of this, the future of big models versus small models, right? And one of the interesting things I think from what you're seeing with Apple is the idea that they can do a lot on device and there can be a lot done with a small model. And then what is the place of kind of big models that are incredibly expensive and incredibly competitive long-term? Do they just become content and what is the positioning there? So I'm kind of curious, and again, knowing you haven't fully caught up yet, how you think about this is kind of, I mean, everyone was expecting small models, but like this is kind of, seems like it's gonna work, right? And kind of what that's gonna look like. Well, I think what on-device small models do would be different than what the large models do. Sure. If you want human-level intelligence from a model, it'll be a big model, and there'll be a couple of them around, uh, some better than others, some a year or two ahead of others. But I don't think small models substitute for big models, but they do some things really well. If you're talking to something with very low latency, you want as short a path, so that'd be a small model on device. In fact, I think Intel, even with its Meteor Lake new processors, bundling a small LLM with it. But they're meant to do responsive interfacing, not yeah. to be the source of intelligence. Sure, but just to push you, and then I want to, we have a lot of ground to cover. You know, it's almost like imagine uh, a future where you have a lot of people you can talk to. Some have IQ 50. Some have IQ 100, some have IQ 10,000, right? And the question is, where do you want to spend the money to ask the IQ 10,000 person a question versus asking the person who might have an IQ of 70, but knows what's in your email, right? And kind of what the balance of where questions get asked and where processing goes. So I guess my question is, is like, right now, I feel like we're basically, and this is partially the cost of the models and the cost of even compute for them. We're asking every question we can come up with to a really, really expensive PhD. And in the future, I think we'll be a lot smarter about who, what level of intelligence we need for different questions. How do you see that competitively playing? I might disagree. I think what will happen is the expensive PhD will become dirt cheap. My bet is mm. a year from now, it'll cost one-fifth to one-tenth of what it does today. And my advice to all our startups is ignore the cost of compute. Because mm -hmm. any assumption you make, any dollar you spend on optimizing your software will be worthless within the year. And so forget about it. Rely on competition in the marketplace between Claude and Gemini and OpenAI uh, to, to, to reduce that cost to a point where it doesn't matter. And below a certain level, it doesn't matter. You're paying a certain amount for your for iPhone service monthly, yeah. if it's 10% or less of that, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Why do you think companies should ignore the cost and it's going to drop so precipitously? What are you seeing? Because every large model owner is trying to drive it down. Well, but, but Vinod, isn't each large model successively that's coming out costing like an order of magnitude more to train? It is costing an order of magnitude more to train. And that's why I don't think open source models will be viable uh, because of the co training costs. But once you're trained, you want as broad a set of usage for two reasons. One, you want the most revenue from it and the lowest cost models will get the most revenue. But more importantly, there's huge data generation for training the next generation of the model. So for lots of reasons, you want to maximize usage. And if you're playing the long game, and I think the AI model game is mostly being played sort of on a five-year time horizon, not a one-year time horizon. In that time horizon, costs will drop. Here today, NVIDIA extracts a fairly good tax from everybody, but every, every model is going to run on multiple types of GPUs or compute, and they will want the most data generation. So I'm pretty convinced the next few years, the revenue isn't the important metric. You don't want to, of course, lose so much money you can't afford it, but you're not trying to make tons of money. You're trying to get tons of usage, and you're trying to get tons of data from the usage and learn to mm. be a better model. Uh, I do think 
there's a lot to be gained in intelligence, whether it's reasoning, whether it's probabilistic thinking, whether it's sort of pattern matching, any of these things. And these models have lots of headroom to get better. And I think we'll see stunning advances practically every year. Much of this has been rumored. Some firms are executing better than others. I think that's the principal difference. I think OpenAI has been very good in execution. But Google has great technology and technologists. They just haven't been as crisp about their execution. So here's my amp it up question. Is you might have guessed, okay. or maybe not, when Britt was referring to the AI skeptic as an investor, that's me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to call you out. Like, but okay. is, I, I'm a huge believer that the big companies are going to make an incredible amount of money uh, on this technology. But I, you know, as a seed investor, we're mostly seed investors on this call. I think what you're happening in the investment market is you're seeing a bunch of what I'll call not real venture capitalists, but asset managers plowing money into AI because it's easy to plow money into AI. And then you're seeing, and I give you a lot of credit for this, Vinod, because I know you actually, I consider you a real venture capitalist, and I know you actually deploy a lot of your own money, <laughs> right? Unlike a lot of these other firms, you actually care about returns because it's actually your money as opposed to other people's money. Only real venture capitalists on the more or less. By the part. way, I, if, since yeah. I started the firm 20 years ago, I've never taken, uh, taken a dollar in fees. There you go. Oh, really? I didn't know that. It's like, we don't make money on fees. This is... Yeah, we're, we're, you know, th that's why, again, I have a lot of respect is you're a DPI guy, that's cool. not an AUM guy. Yep. But again, like, you actually invest across the spectrum, right? And my kind of thing has been at the extreme of the seed investing. I think most seed investors getting into AI are playing a fool's errand because it's not a place where one to three million dollars really can move the needle in terms of value, in terms of what the game is. So to me, it's like not a, it, it's. Clearly a place the big guys win. You can argue about the middle, maybe, and I'd love to hear where, I mean, you obviously have a different opinion than me there. And then at the seed, it's a disaster from a, from a VC perspective. I'm curious if you, like, I assume you think I'm wrong, but I'd be curious what your take is. Well, <laughs> let me give you some very specific examples. So I was pretty excited earlier in the podcast about Symbolica. Yeah. They came with a ridiculous set of claims in January or February of 2023. And I said, fine, I'll give you a $2 million seed. And if you prove this out, then we can talk more. They came back in March of this year, not very long ago, and said, here's the results that I promised. I said, don't go out. I'll write you a $15 million check tomorrow, which yep. we did. Yep. So we just went ahead and did the financing. We didn't wait for outside pricing. We didn't wait for others to weigh in. I didn't care about anybody else's opinion. We bet on it. So that's sort of the small seed turning into a larger investment into something larger. Fair By the way, we have a lot of robotic seeds still. Yeah. The real tiny ones that'll grow. But take Hedral, the structural engineer I was talking about. It's a seed. Yeah. It's never going to take 50 million or 100 million. It's going to be a seed that grows into a profitable business if that works. Yeah. So I do think there's room for seed, but following what everybody else is doing is a bad strategy. Yes. Anytime somebody leaves deep, deep mind, give them $2 million, that's a bad strategy. <laughs> <laughs> On this, we agree. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, we got one. We got one, Sam. <laughs> we spend an incredible amount of time thinking about which business plan will be railroaded by GPT-5, GPT-6, mm -hmm. Sora 2, Sora 3. Yep. And, you know, we have pretty good access. We, 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 we're reasonably good at predicting what will be railroaded and what won't be. Yep. And what will be good partnerships. Yeah. 